Thank you, Malik, for having me, my colleagues at the Smithsonian for tolerating me, and the folks at Old Press Raw for providing me, not with water, but with a ginger snap beverage, which I'm told will uh, ease my inflammation. Um, so happy tax day, and here we are to talk about risk. This is a slide that's intentionally been left blank. This is Asheville, North Carolina in 1987. And that's me right there in the center, uh, my aforementioned sister uh, there behind me to the left. This is the first moment on record in which I willfully put myself in harm's way, also known as taking a risk. Um, the story before I ever saw the photo was told as follows. I intrepidly hoisted myself up, took a handful of steps, uh, stood there bewildered, triumphant as my sister clapped. Seeing the photograph, it seems things may have gone a little bit otherwise. And, and you'll note the position of my sister's hands as well as what could be misconstrued as a smile, but it's, it's on the edge of a grimace, right? Because it's an ambiguous scene. It's unclear what exactly is going to happen. Will I indeed foist myself up or will I tumble? Uh, irreparably maiming that wonderful face. <laughs> There's also the matter of posturing. It's entirely illogical, as you can see. No one should lift up the opposite arm and leg to try and foist themselves into a stand. Um, I tried it myself, actually, late last night, when I couldn't sleep, just imagining all these faces judging me as I, I stood before the microphone. So I tried this, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, I injured myself, it was terrible. <laughs> and yet here, the determination, you see it in the furrowed brow, a certain single-mindedness, the ferocious and endless focus on a goal with no sense, mind you, of the risks that lay before me. This is the face of a man on a mission with no idea of the dangers that awaited me in the world. <laughs> and the eyes, burning yet again with that single-minded determination. <laughs> Let it be known that indeed, I did stand, and I did walk, and I did not fall. <laughs> this is Hubert Latham. Note as well, the wistful gaze. <laughs> he was a pioneer aviator from France who in July of, <clears throat> pardon me, 1909, set about to become the first person to cross the English Channel and claim <clears throat> a 1,000 pound prize from one of the leading newspapers that had put out the call. And this is Latham above the English Channel in his Antoinette monoplane. Uh, rather rudimentary design by today's standards, though, though then advanced. Uh, you'll notice the canvas wings, quite a bit like a bird. Uh, whenever I see this, I, I think, of course, of Icarus, who, tempting fate, flew a bit too close to the sun. And as the heat melted his waxen wings, he plummeted to his destiny, calling out before falling beneath the sea. Uh, Latham, Latham did not fall beneath the sea. Um, here you see the, the English Channel. It's a very small stretch they had to cross, about 22, 22 miles. That point over there uh, is, is Calais on the right and on the left, Dover, uh, a rather windswept region, which uh, turned out to, to be a bit of a rue to all of the aviators, uh, namely Latham and a gentleman you'll meet in a moment who sought to claim this prize. Uh, if the wind was more than 10 miles an hour, it was unlikely that you could take off. Uh, Latham nevertheless did, and he crashed to the sea, uh, inadvertently becoming the first person to successfully make a water landing. <laughs> this is Louis Blerio, his main competitor in the world of early aviation. Uh, as opposed to Latham, who is known as a bit of a carouser and, and ruffian, Blerio had um, a much more stoic disposition. He was an inventor, an engineer, and uh, also apparently had no fear. Uh, Latham had no fear, but he was also mostly drunk, so it's neither here nor there. <laughs> Lario had his wits about him. Um, as Latham and his crew slept one night uh, after a, a long bit of carousing, uh, the winds finally died down at around 2.20 a.m., and Lario's crew roused him. He was finally ready to take off at sunrise, and he did. And before Latham and his crew could muster the plane, Blerio was finally reaching the cliffs of Dover. And here you see Blerio on the left, uh, mid-trip through the channel. This is July 1925. And on the right, you see him with his grand reception. And there's Latham. Yeah. Uh. But you shouldn't feel too bad for him. He went on actually after this to win numerous awards and honors in various national and international aviation meets before he finally did meet an untimely end in 1912 when he was gored by a buffalo. 
while hunting in west africa. it's also possible that he was murdered by his porter, but for now i couldn't find ah an image of a porter, so let's say he was gored by a buffalo. and such are are the risks of just about everything whatsoever. um it's been fascinating to see over maybe the past decade, certainly the the past handful of years, how risk has been enshrined uh, and reified as a kind of value, right? We we say, or at least our brothers in Silicon Valley, and I suppose Austin and Nashville and probably Miami as well, uh, rallying around this idea that we should fail hard and we should fail fast, which is all well and good, I suppose, until a train flies off the tracks, as they did in 1909 on the Illinois Central Railway or two airplanes collide or upend, or as you see here at the bottom, these are all from the Wolfsonian's collection, by the way, um, the Atlas aircraft named for the famed Titan who was meant to hold up the divide between heaven and earth, here crashing back down uh, by the force of, of nature. Um, it's all well and good until you find that your hands have been sliced or stamped or diced, or you get gored by a buffalo in West Africa. Yeah. This is me, again. <laughs> right there. Uh, for anyone who can't tell in the back, the star is clip art. It's not, it's not something I was wearing at the time. I wasn't wearing anything except for roller skates. This is probably around 1989, 1990, roughly three years old. Um, at this point, you can see by the defiant look at the camera, I had become well aware of risk. I simply didn't care. Um, I was bold. I was fearless. I'm not now, but I was then. <laughs> standing at the edge of stairs in a small town called Wallaca. Does everybody here know where Wallaca is? It's right near Palatka. <laughs> right there. It's sort of near Jacksonville, right? This is at a, a farm in Wallaca, which is near Palatka, which is south of Jacksonville. And I'm standing at the edge of the stairs, naked, except for this clip art star, wearing roller skates that are unbuckled. <laughs> Hope you can see that. Staring defiantly at the camera. These were my fearless days. Things, things have changed since then. The bruising decades that have followed have, have beaten my risk tolerance out of me. I have a scar on, on this finger, eight years old. It was a, a craft project for school. The X-Acto knife slipped. I have a, a scar here as well, uh, 11 years old, a wood shop accident. Yet again, an X-Acto knife slipped. I have one here, I, I don't know where it came from. Uh, one, one on my knee from when I was 14 on a camping trip. One beneath my chin, it's now, now covered with. Small bit of hair. The, the hair here was longer, but the sun that you saw earlier was pulling chunks of it out, um, so I had to trim it down today. But there's, there's a scar underneath there uh, from roughhousing behind the bleachers uh, one day in elementary school. When I was 13 years old, I snapped my clavicle, that's, that's the collarbone, uh, while snowboarding in western Massachusetts. And at age 21, I cracked my forearm um, while bicycling in Philadelphia. The latter was not my fault. It was an overeager motorist that just clipped the, the front of the bicycle wheel. But the snowboarding accident, I assumed the risk, and therefore, it was roundly my fault. Um, and after it happened, my mother asked me, was it worth it, right? Was it worth it going on your snowboard and doing what you do? Was it worth it for, for the injury you have now? And I couldn't answer her at the time. I, I didn't quite have the tools, um, but I do now. I made this for you in MS Paint. <laughs> it's a standard risk-reward chart. You can see there on the x-axis you have risk, and on the y-axis you have reward. And in an ideal world, the greater your risk, the greater your reward, right? If, is there a laser pointer on this? I, I was told there was. Green button on the top. Green button on the top. I'd say that the, the risk of what I was doing was about there, but the reward was there. So we could say it, it wasn't really worth it. Mom's not here, but for the record, since we're on video, it, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> but this is an oversimplification, of course, right? We can't simply judge things by risk and reward, or if we can, the variables are numerous. Um, so here's another chart. You can see the level of risk on the, on the left and the division into the broadly acceptable region of risk, the intolerable region of risk, and the region in which it is tolerable, but nevertheless, you seek to keep risk as low as feasibly possible. Uh, reasonably practical, pardon me. I don't really know how this is supposed to work. There's too many vectors, but it's, it's complicated. So to bring things back down to Earth, um, here's, here's another visualization of risk-reward. Um, if, you, if you search risk tolerance on Google, it turns out that the, the strongest metaphor for it is mostly white men in business suits on a tightrope. <laughs> 
It actually doesn't work well because you've already assumed risk if you're on the tightrope. But here you, you can see there it's risk reward and how do we balance these out? Um, so the question we should all ask ourselves, I ask myself every day, is what is my risk tolerance? Because different people have a different tolerance for risk. Uh, if you are working on investments or simply crossing the street, you need to decide what your risk tolerance is. Uh, pirates, for instance, um, have a very high tolerance for risk. They do. Swashbuckling, swashbuckling psychopaths who board ships in search of booty and scallywags, knowing full well that, that things may befall them. This is Captain Morgan, Captain Henry Morgan of famed uh, Captain Morgan's rum, of which he has no affiliation. Um, he, he died like 400 years ago, but um, he was actually a privateer, by the way. It's a thin line between a privateer and a pirate. It all has to do with the crown and whether you're attacking the Spanish or your own people. But uh, here's Captain Morgan, and you can see a prisoner and, and the scallywags and the booty. Um, but if you look closely, you'll also notice the head bandages. One can assume there's a peg leg or two back there. Um, pirates assume a lot of risk, and they do it knowingly. Um, as opposed to the popular image of the swashbuckling, <clears throat> pardon me, psychopath, pirates were actually a pretty well-organized um, set of bandits. They, they had their own internal governance systems and their own internal economic logic, among which is the earliest version of modern, work, modern workers' comp. Um, so before you went in, there was a code of ethics and a code of conduct where it was understood, and it was really more of a, a motivating force than a social safety net, but nevertheless, uh, if you lost your left arm, you'd receive however many pieces of eight, which was actually less than you'd receive. If you lost your right arm, because the right arm, by and large, was more useful, same thing for left leg and right leg. The exact same system that used to be used in factories, except it would be measured by the amount of hours, uh, and generally you are paid more hours off for an injury to the right arm than the left, um, amnidextrous not, notwithstanding. Uh, so that's, that's risk. This is the game of risk. <laughs> Has everybody here played risk? Jessica back there. I've never played Risk. I tried once, actually. It, it takes a really long time, um, so I never finished. But in Risk, you're dealing essentially, first and foremost, with probabilities. Uh, the way it works for anyone who hasn't played, this is obviously an artistic rendering of a Risk board, just in case anybody thought I was trying to pull one over on them. Um, but you see it's divided into a series of continents. You also have these game pieces, the continent cards. That's a rule book. That's the box they come in. And the idea is that you're trying to conquer the world. And you do this by distributing your, your troops through territories. You can have attacking troops, defending troops. You roll the dice. And so it's all based on the probability that a particular dice roll will come out in a certain way, measured against the number of troops. Uh, to help you visualize this, this is the series of nodes that your pieces could occupy. Um, it probably doesn't help you much, but you see Asia and Australia and so forth. I have learned over the course of this, it's best to start by taking the small continents and then massing your troops around the edges of any particular node is how you try to win. Um, so there you have it. But you need to be, before you invade or before you decide where exactly to distribute your troops, decide on the set of probabilities that you will win or lose, whether in part or in whole. Um, you can see here a, a, another basic chart that shows you on the x-axis the attacking force, uh, down there on the y-axis the defending force. And everything is pretty clear early on, right? So if you are the attacking force against a small defending force, you will win. Same goes for large defense over small offense. But it's up in here that things become a bit more dodgy. That's where you can't really minimize your risk entirely because, of course, these things are complicated. Uh, just how complicated you can visualize here in a little code that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's called the Monte Carlo Code. Uh, it was put together by some folks at MIT. And what it does is it carries out every single variable for dice rolls measured against troop placement and troop density uh, that you could possibly have on the board. Um, impractical, not just because you're not going to run this every time you roll the dice, but because there's something else at play here, and that's the human variable, um, what we like to call in the workplace the viability um, of your strategy as well as the possibility that your negligence, negligence um, will lead to, to uh, unfavorable consequences. Um, so we have to factor in the human variable. And for that reason, we have in our collection, as well as in the world, a little thing that we like to call uh, work safety imagery. And so this is my gift to you, just advice, basically, as we, we round things out. Um, for anybody who works around flammable materials, don't, don't carry a lit wick while you're handling them, uh, or you will provoke Milani inenorable, that's unspeakable misfortunes. Um, don't leave oil on the floor, or the hospital will be on the horizon. Uh, don't change light bulbs while standing in water. <laughs> don't put your hand too close to the belt. And for all you ladies out there, whatever you do, tie up your hair when working on drill presses. 
please. <laughs> please. Yeah, gib oct sonst, that means be careful or else. Uh, be careful when you're changing light bulbs that you don't touch any live wires or bring the metal into contact with other pieces of metal, particularly if there's moisture present, is, is what all that tells you. Uh, watch out for live wires above your head and this is, this is from my own mother, who's, who's not here, but if she watches this later, if all else fails, when you go off to the workplace, just think of mother. <laughs> Donk on motor. Think of mother. Or you can do what I do now after those bruising years. Just don't take risks. <laughs> just, just don't. Thank you.